Welcome to the LeaderCast podcast, a weekly deep dive into the stories that transformed our guests into leaders worth following. I'm your host, Joe Boyd. Welcome to the LeaderCast podcast. Today's guest is Kelly Leonard. He is the Executive Director of Learning and Applied Improvisation at the world-famous Second City in Chicago. This episode is very close to my heart as the Second City is part of my story, changed my life. In this episode, you will hear Kelly open up about how improv helped him through the very darkest moments of his life. He'll give you some tips on how to find a mentor, and you'll learn who the famous director was that he started at the Second City with when they were both washing dishes. Kelly Leonard, welcome to the LeaderCast podcast. So excited to have you today. I'm so happy to be here. This is awesome. Uh, the folks that have been following along know that uh, Second City was such a huge part of my uh, life story. And uh, just to recap, like I was I was in my mid late twenties in a in a career that I was struggling with. I, I had mm-hmm. clinical depression, but I didn't know it. And I went to see the Second City show in Vegas. Uh, and I lived in Vegas at the time. And it was uh, with uh, Jason Sudeikis, Kay Cannon, Holly Walker, that whole crew. Yeah. And I, I told my wife after the show in like a de- the most like depressive moment ever. I was like, <laughs> she's like, didn't you love it? It was my Christmas gift. And I was like, yeah, I just I'm so sad because I wish I'd done that with my life. Wow. And so she got me immediately got me into the training center uh, mm-hmm. just at, for fun. And before I knew it, it, it had become a second career. And I was doing improv on the Vegas Strip and nine months later. And uh, but beyond all that career stuff, it just, it really taught me, I think, how to be present and how to That's right. listen and how to, how to be comfortable with myself, all sorts of stuff. So enough about me, but you're here because you're with the second city and you've been there for, uh, forever. And I want to talk uh, a lot today, just about how leadership intersects with improvisation and, and your story. Great. Um, but could you tell, uh, for those folks that, uh, don't know a ton about improv comedy in the second city, could you just tell us a little bit about, about what it is and what you do? Yeah. So the Second City uh, started in 1959. Um, and uh, but the, but the story goes back a little bit farther. And I think it's it's interesting. So if people know us, they know that we do sketch comedy, that it's kind of a, a, a kind of like Silent Live, but also whose line is it anyway? So there's two acts of scripted content and a third act that's improvised. But what's really interesting is how we got to where we got in 1959. And that starts in the 20s and 30s. There was a woman by the name of Viola Spolin, uh, who was a social worker, and she worked at Jane Addams Hull House on the south side of Chicago. And her job was to better assimilate immigrant kids who were coming into her care. So she developed all these improv games and exercises that the kids would play. A lot of them were in gibberish or silence because the kids didn't always share language, but allowed Mm -hmm. them to collaborate, communicate, empathize. Her son, Paul Sills, is studying at the University of Chicago, loves these games, teaches them to his friends, Mike Nichols, Elaine May, among others. They formed the first improvisational theater in America called the Compass Players in 1957. And two years later, that morphs into the Second City. So you probably know so many famous people that have come out of Second City, people like Alan Arkin, Tina Fey, Stephen Colbert, Keegan-Michael Key, just the list goes on and on and on. But so many people like yourself find themselves taking classes, not because they think they're going to get on Saturday Night Live, but they find something else in the in these classes. And that's the really important thing that we've sort of developed over the years, which is we have a really big school and we do a lot of corporate work teaching people improv as a way to navigate the world they live in. None of us are handed scripts. <laughs> Unless you're in the Truman Show, most of us don't have scripts. And right. so we have to navigate what become increasingly complex spaces um, as, as we, you know, morph ourselves into parents and leaders and, you know, all, all the different things that we have to do in the world. It's not like the world gets easier as you get older. And I hate to break that to other folks who are listening to this thing. <laughs> it, it gets harder, but hopefully, and I think improv is a big thing here. Hopefully you have practices, uh, wisdom, skills that you can apply to these situations um, to maybe be a bit more graceful, but really at the end of the day, what we're talking about is human beings make stuff with other human beings and improv is all about exercises to make that more effective. Yeah. I love that. I love how you, you tie it. And I think, I think folks know like second city and, and some of the other improv comedy theaters do the sort of corporate training and that kind of thing. People yeah. are kind of aware of that. Uh, yeah. but I think folks might think that it just is like, a 
I don't want to overstate it, but maybe maybe a little gimmick that you could do because people like right. the comedy. So we'll we'll, sure. we'll find some way to make it apply to real life. But to know that the whole art form actually started not trying to do comedy. It started no. really trying to have human connection. Exactly. And I, I we just did uh, a bunch of workshops for Solomon Partners and, and the CEO there just sent me a note. He follows my podcast and brought us in. And he's like, this is the kind of culture that I want. And so, you know, the, the title of my book and, and one of the most salient improv concepts is this idea of yes and. And what we know from, say, behavioral economics is that people's default position is to say no or do nothing. And yes mm-hmm. and is literally a nudge to do the opposite. Um, and and one of the things that's crucial to know about yes and is that like, it's not about yes anding forever. <laughs> yes yeah. and's about the first five minutes of a meeting. You know, it's about in the Second City uh, world of creating a comedy review, it's the first four weeks of rehearsal when you're developing material where you allow everything to have yeah. a shot. And then you do a lot of no after that. But what's yeah. great about yes and is if you yes and everyone's ideas initially, the no's are fine later because your ideas have been listened to and vetted and probably have influenced um, the other ideas that are moving forward. So really improv across the board is such a pro-social practice. Um, and I think that it, it, it's so at odds with the, way the world is right now, right? Yeah. We're so polarized. We're so bent on canceling and muting and all the other words. And the reality is like, hey, everyone, we don't do this alone. Like this, this is the, the human endeavor is not going to yeah. get better unless we're all working together. And that means we have to have space to fail, to disagree, uh, to be seen and to be heard. And that stuff's not easy, obviously, because we find ourselves constantly locking horns over the dumbest stuff in the world. Look at Twitter right now. Yeah. Um, when, you know, and I, you probably remember this from, from just going to class, like when you're in that classroom, and you learn that your only job is to save the other people around you, and that's their only job, changes the stakes completely. Yeah. Yeah. When people find out that I did improv, the, you know, a lot of folks just assume it's stand up comedy. And, right. Uh, and uh, I tried stand up comedy and uh, I was reasonably okay at it, but I actually hated it. It felt, yeah. especially because I did improv first, it felt so yeah. lonely and, and dark. <laughs> completely. And I was like, completely I just different wanna... practice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd rather a, fail with a bunch of my friends than by myself. I guess. Right, right, right. I mean, <laughs> it's an amazing skill that you can also draw some leadership right. and other things out of in terms of the way you have to communicate, sharing vulnerability. I think one thing that my, my wife is a uh, a comedy professor, a tenured professor of comedy. And so and she got a new book coming out in a year uh, based on all this stuff. But mm-hmm. st- stand up comics, if you notice your, your favorite ones, usually start by revealing something that's wrong with themselves. Patton yeah. Oswald is a schlub, um, you know, John Mulaney's a drunk, what, what, whatever it is. Right. And what, what they're doing is their perspective giving. They're letting the audience see a little bit of who they are and what their struggle is. And I think that's something that good leaders also do. Like, I don't yeah. want to hear all your successes. I want to hear your fiascos and how you got through them. Yeah. Um, so that's something you can draw from, from, from standup. But then all the other sort of behaviors that scientists have revealed as being effective in terms of leadership are very much more improv centered in terms of being collaborative, uh, creating uh, psychological safety, uh, operating with growth mindset, all those concepts uh, that they're teaching at business schools all over the country are are very much connected to, to improv. This is awesome. I could talk about this all day and I'm sure uh, there's some sort of time limit on this podcast and your, and your time, of course. Uh, one of the things we we like to do, I like to do with this podcast is, is so we have a we have a ton of leaders leadership sort of uh, resources for folks on our platform. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the co- for this though, I I really like to get as as personal as you're willing to get. And just sure. what you were saying, uh, I want to learn a little bit about your actual story and and how yeah. you ended up here today. We use sort of the hero's journey as the backdrop. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sure mm-hmm. you're familiar with that uh, yep. of how we all are kind of born in what feels like an ordinary or normal world. And then we get a call to adventure and uh, we usually reject the call, but a mentor tends to come along and, and tells us to go for it. And there's dragons that stand in our way to get what we want. Mm-hmm. And it all gets changed along the way until at some point, especially folks, maybe our age start to realize, Oh, I, I kind of got what I wanted, but it was totally different than I expected. Yeah. Um, and so what I, I would just love, could you take me back to like your, your childhood when you're a little kid or you're a teenager, sure. like what, what were those ambitions? And and I love to ask, like, were there any kind of 
adventure stories that lived in your heart? Like, were you, were you, uh, yeah. any sort of comic book or cartoon or anything that kind of got your attention? Um, For sure. and l- let's just learn a little bit about little Kelly. What was, what was he into? <laughs> yeah. So I'm the youngest of six boys and, uh, my dad was a longtime radio and TV personality here in Chicago. So he was actually, when I was born, he was in Boston and his station went rock and he had a talk show. So sent out tapes all around the nation, ended up coming to WGN Radio here in Chicago. And um, so we moved. So when I was one, we moved from Boston to the Chicago area. Um, so I had I had a really interesting childhood in the sense that I had such access to culture. So yeah. my dad reviewed film and theater. Um, and so I was going to movies and concerts. I saw Paul McCartney in 1976 and the Wings Over America tour, went backstage, got to meet him. Coolest yeah. thing ever. <laughs> um, my dad was the honorary, uh, uh, I think they called a conductor at the, at the circus. So I got to ride an elephant with him. Oh, and there's nice. pictures of that. <laughs> Marcel Marceau, the great French mime came to dinner. Um, wow. uh, he was in the resistance. He told war stories. So, and, and then when I was in college, I was writing my thesis on the beat generation and my dad happened to be interviewing Allen Ginsberg. So I tagged along with him and ended up like sitting for four hours in a coffee shop in Chicago talking to Allen Ginsberg about beat poetry and, and his friendships with Jack Kerouac and those sort of people. And so what I was thinking about, was there a mythological sort of figure, certainly like college Kelly, who was also getting into theater at that at that yeah. time? Um, uh, I was all about like, Sal Paradise from On the Road. I, I, I did not assume I was going to live long. I assumed I was going to be living uh, a debaucherous life of 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 literature and um, you know whatever uh, <laughs> things cha- things went the other way for me and, and in part yeah. because I was I was writing plays in college and they were getting produced and I was like I think I want to be a playwright and it's funny because I think I have the only parents in America who when their youngest says I want to be a playwright they're like thank God because yeah. <laughs> all the other all the right. other brothers had respectable careers. They're they're right. in banking and they're an architect or whatever. And so and and my my dad and mom met in a play. Like she cast him in a play. So this is the, the that yeah. meant something. So one of the things my dad said, I can't get you a job, but I can get you some informational interviews. So I met with Rock Schulfer, who still runs the Goodman Theater, and that was great. But then I met with Bernie Solomons, who was the co-founder of Second City. He had sold Second City, but he was opening a new theater and he hired me. Uh, But the gig wasn't starting uh, for like six months. So Mm -hmm. he called over to his friend, Joyce Sloan, who was running Second City at the time, got me a job here. And my first gig out of college was as a dishwasher at Second City, Um, (laughs) which is not as glamorous as it sounds, because the back bar in those days, um, (laughs) there was all alcoholics and sociopaths. It was like just terrible. The other guy who got hired that week with me was John Favreau, the film director, and we both had mullets. So <laughs> was Favreau a dishwasher as well? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so we did wow. that together. And then I hosted the room and I went to go work for Bernie's theater when it opened. That thing failed real quickly, came back and got hired into the box office here. And then I just like, I don't know. I think I have, I'm, I'm a restless human being and I am not interested in um, learning things that don't interest me. And I'm voraciously interested in learning things that do interest me. Right. Yeah. So when I got into the box, I was like, okay, how does how can I make this work better? I'm interested in this. Yeah. And so I started implementing some changes and they were successful. Um, and then created the first marketing department in Second City. They didn't have it. Uh, and this is all in like late, it's like 89, 90, 91. And then in 1992, at the age of 26, I was asked to be the producer of the Second City. And there'd only been two before me. Um, and it's again, I, I was not necessarily qualified for it, um, but I showed initiative. I showed up on time. I worked hard. And I was very lucky in the sense that my first cast was Steve Col- Stephen Colbert, Steve Carell, and Amy Sedaris were in it. Uh, first group I hired were people like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, developed shows with Seth Meyers. So it was a real magic era that I got to step into. And and ev- eventually, I think I got pretty good at Good at, good at the job. So you were like their contemporary. You're about their age, or maybe even younger. Yeah, than we're all around. Right? Yeah, and Adam McKay, yeah. another person, is a good, good dear friend. Yeah, we all grew up together. So we we're, yeah. you know, we we'd all hang. We go to the diner after the show, or go catch a 
basketball yeah. game or whatever. So that, but then the other, the thing you learn, and I think this is probably true with most leaders, which is real hard to be friends with your employees. Well, that's what um, I was going to ask. Cause you're, especially if you're like buddies in the same age, it's not a lot of folks yeah. listening to this are in that situation where they're now they're suddenly the yeah. you know, supervisor, you know, I, I had to, I mean, it's not like you can't be friendly. It's not like you can't build a strong relationship, but you have to create some boundaries and everyone does. That's true for, for employees should be doing it from their bosses and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a new boss here and it's, um, uh, he's our new CEO, Ed Wells. Um, this guy is, I mean, I think, I think he's been here eight weeks, best leader I've ever worked for. Wow. Bar none. This is, this is the first leader I've worked with or been in, you know, collaboration with who basically does all the stuff that the business books tell you you should do yes. with regard to creating an atmosphere that feels, again, psychologically safe. There's good feedback. There's celebrating wins publicly. And if there's any concerns, those are sh shared privately, you know, it ticks every box. Yeah. And I was not that starting out. I mean, I, I think I, and I, I, I've had time to reflect on this because yeah. <laughs> just to sort of go with my career. So I, I produced from 1992 to 2015 and 2015, I co-wrote the book. Yes. And uh, which is about how we take our improv principles into the business world. And that did very well and started going on the speaker circuit. I ended up stepping down from producing really without a game plan. And, and so what ended up happening is um, uh, I just started like, found myself at the University of Chicago and and built a program with with them for four years called the Second Science Project. So a lot of work in academia uh, and then also new business development, just it's a natural thing for me. So the first part of my career was all improv on stage. And now for the last like seven years and moving forward, I think my world is improv off stage. So applied, yes, in, in, in business, but also we've done work in um, caregiving spaces with uh, mm -hmm. hospitals and other kinds of at-home caregivers. Um, we've worked in improv with people on the autism uh, spectrum, um, improv for anxiety, um, all these sort of interesting ways that when you think about, here, here's the bottom line is um, soft skills needs a new name because yeah. it's the hardest skill. <laughs> these right. are the hardest skills. Yeah. And uh, there's not a lot of robust soft skill training. That's what we do. It's 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 real skills building around listening to understand and, and listening for someone's intent. They not they might be saying words, but those words might not be the thing that they're really trying to communicate to you. How do you get to that? And if you think about great improv, it's all about discovering the thing that's underneath the other thing the person was saying. That yeah. that could be very funny. But you know the aha aha uh line is 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 very interesting, right? So part part of what processing processing a joke is is you're having a moment of insight like mm -hmm. oh this is revealing itself and that's funny to me but it's the same part of the brain that is actually achieving an insight i am learning something mm -hmm. uh and there's neuroscience that's been done recently out of china that shows that that's the same part of the the brain system that's processing that insight and so that stuff can be practiced um and by the way it's a lot like working out you can't just go to the gym once and you're done yeah. The, the the key to this stuff is that you're you're doing it as much as you can all the time. Oh man, I love this stuff. I, I one thing I wonder is like, you know, in the world you came up in, uh you get a lot of uh kudos and you get your self-esteem, I would assume, from the stage shows and yep. uh seeing folks around you make it and maybe you make it or you don't have you define yep. making it, right? Right. Um and then I wonder if if you were in the in the middle of that producing area of your life and you knew, say, in 10 years, I want to be spending most of my time off the stage teaching improv. Right. Do you think back then that would have felt like an exciting future for you? Or would you be kind of shocked that that's that's the way your path went? I think I'd be shocked. I mean, the the it's it's hard because the the you know, I'm friends with a lot of these scientists now who who we've done done work with. And all the literature says, like, basically every 10 years of your life, you 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 think like, like I'm sitting right now going, I'm so wise in 10 years, I'm going to think I'm an idiot. Sure. And yeah. then, and that, that is, that is the pretty much what, what's awaiting me. And I, and I understand that. Yeah. Um, a couple of things, uh, for better or worse, earlier leaders that I've had at second city were constantly throwing curveballs at me. 
So I'd, I'd have a lot of success in an area and they'd say, okay, we're taking that area away from you. Now you have to do this. And I would go do it. Um, and I would have success in it. So that's a kind of superpower until you're in therapy with your therapist and you realize that that same superpower also means that you've allowed yourself to be taken advantage of, maybe even abused, what all, all that stuff. And, and yeah. so there's no joy without suffering. There's no suffering without joy. And the, the twist and turns that I've taken, especially in the last, um, you know, five years or so. I mean, my, my wife and I have a, uh, our daughter, Nora was diagnosed with cancer when she had uh, turned um, uh, 16 and, and she passed away three years ago uh, when she turned just after turning 17 and navigating first navigating the illness. We were actually very adept because Anne and I had actually created this improvisation for caregivers program. We knew how to communicate with these medical professionals we knew how to create a space where nor we could keep Nora in good spirits and and all that. And while it was very hard and we didn't want to really be there, we knew we had to play the scene we were in, not the scene we wanted to be in. Every mm -hmm. improv skill that I have and, and had, we applied in that moment. Um, and then when Nora died, it was like, oh, well, that's a different, this is now a different improv. So one of the things I did when Nora got sick, I kept a carrying bridge journal uh, and then I kept going the year after she died and I was brutally honest about where I was at. And what I discovered, because I had a lot of people I worked with who, who were following that is that people would share with me the crap they were going through. And I had no idea. I had no idea how many people are hurting out there. So I don't know how many people are listening to this podcast. Yeah. I will bet you 90 to 95% of them have some tragedy that they're dealing with that they probably can't talk to people at work about yeah which is terrible like like i would not have survived i would not be here today if i wasn't able to come to second city and have my coworkers be able to help hold me up and make space for me and again there's a lot of literature on, on this and how if we ignore suffering at work uh we are we're doing damage to productivity we're doing damage to the people that we need to work for us and work with us so that kind of like those big swings and those kinds of things that happen and then trying to reincorporate yourself is like, okay, so now I want to, I've got this thing that happened, the worst thing that could possibly happen to, you know, to anyone. Um, yeah. But I want to flourish as a human being and I have work that's still important to me. And it really, it, it requires such focus, such presence, um, uh, connection recognizing that again there's loads of research that there, there's a thing called the grant study that's been going on at harvard for 80 some years where they followed one group of men and what what they've discovered is that essentially lifetime happiness wealth health all of that is predicted by the amount of good relationships you have yeah so if it's coming down to good relationships Improvisation is all about seeding the practices for good relationships. I just threw a lot at you. Well, no, I actually have goosebumps. And I, I uh, thank, first of all, thank you for sharing about Nora. That's, sure. you know, you, it, thank you. You didn't have to mm -hmm. share that. And um, uh, I think as I, as I, uh, th this company leadercast has been going 21 years. It's, it's, it's influenced hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. it's quite a, an unexpected and humbling task to accept leading it over the last couple of years. Yep. Um, but I don't, cause I'm not sure I'm a good leader, <laughs> uh, but at, at least I got, at least I know I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I feel it's, the same way. Intimi it's intimidating to lead like a, yeah. a big leadership company, you know? And, uh, but the one thing that I will not budge on is it in the end, and I always feel a little fatalistic when I say it, but in the end, if you have the ability uh, to be sort of self-aware that your days are ending, all you're going to think about are your relationships. That's you right. That, that, that's all you're going to think about. Yeah. And as leaders, you know, we, we have all these very important things. We're supposed to be leading people to achieve certain tasks and make a certain amount of money to, to do all these things. They're not bad, but in the end, we won't think about that. We'll be thinking about yeah. the folks that we actually loved. And so, uh, 
so I really appreciate that. And it, and it helps me, uh, you know, I, uh, I have a faith background. I actually went to seminary and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, faith still important to me, but one of the things I said is my faith was sort of working for me, but I didn't have a religion. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if that makes sense, but, but improv no, kind of sure. gave me improv gave me sort of religious rules to sort of live by if that makes any That's sense. Right. And I'm probably sounding like a heretic to some people right now, but, um, well, here's but, why you, here's but, why you don't here's why you don't sound yeah, like a heretic. Yeah. We have to admit that the world has changed, and and we know this. Like people don't believe in institutions; they're leaving their their faith traditions in droves. Uh, they they're moving to urban centers where they don't even know their neighbors' names. This yeah. is the this is the and now when you have social media, people think they have some sort of social life because they're reacting on on uh, on social media when it's a version of a social life, but it's not actually people in a room doing something together. Right. Um, and so, so what, what do you build in its wake? And there's many, many people that, that I've interviewed for the podcast who, who were at seminary school at Harvard and, and running those programs who've yeah. decided that, no, I'm not looking to join church, but what I want to do is bring those same rights and beliefs and practices into my daily life. And yeah. improv is one thing where you can point to that. There, there's adages, there's sayings, there's doings. Um, there, there are, our, our temples are our theaters, um, yeah. that, that all become part of that and don't necessarily, they, they sort of blur the line between, um, the secular and, and the religious. And, and I think that's, that's a good thing. I think we need, we need all those. One of the things I grew up Catholic, I'm, I don't have an interest in joining the Catholic church. That doesn't mean I didn't think the churches were beautiful and I didn't love the music and some of the rites. They, they, they had powerful signals yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of those are belonging sig signals back to our point which is vital for human beings. I'm actually reading this book by Jeffrey Cohen called Belonging. And it's the science of creating connection and bridging divides. And every yeah. chapter goes deep in the science of things like mentorship. There's a whole incredible chapter on the unbelievable power of mentorship um, and, and in terms of wise connectedness. So not, not just that we're connected, but that we're actually, we have people who... I, I try to surround myself with at least three to four truth tellers who are yeah. going to be able to be like, dude, yeah, not cool. <laughs> well, man, we're speaking the same language. And what, what made me sort of go off that, I didn't plan on talking about that part of my life, but um, is how you, the very worst moment of your life, you actually were able to fall back on your improv training, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a hunch that um, to show that it, it's, it's a big deal and it's very human. And honestly, it's, it's some of the best stuff you learn uh, practicing religion as well, right? Is is that to be present? To yeah, be, to I can humble. give you actually a very specific thing. So, yeah. so when Ann and I were working on the second science project, this is with the Booth School of Business. We would work with these behavioral scientists. Sometimes they would come to us with phenomenon that they'd studied. Sometimes we would say, "Hey, check out this improv exercise. We think it's related to potentially a piece of phenomenon." And 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 then sometimes we would make bespoke, bespoke exercises. In particular, we're working with a scientist, Nick Epley, who has this great book called Mind Wise. And part of Epley's work shows that human beings uh, tend to um, not, not feel comfortable self-disclosing. They, they don't think other people care. They don't want to share details of themselves when, in fact, the opposite is tends to be true. And when you do even low stake sharing, um, worlds open. So yes. Anne actually created an exercise that we developed at the University of Chicago, taught in corporate and, and continue to teach called Universal Unique. So the idea is you pair up two people and you give them a banal activity like grocery shopping. And so person A, you're going to say how human beings grocery shop. You just use the universal you. And so they do that for about a minute. She goes, okay, now stop. Now I want you to think about how you personally grocery shop and now take a minute and do that. Completely changes the game. Yeah. And then people are like, and, and people will say, I learned a lot about you just hearing how you grocery shop because mm -hmm. we're all freaks and we all have our like <laughs> weird little things that we do. Right. So one of the things that happens when you're in a hospital with your daughter getting treated for cancer, you have so many different caregivers. They, they change out and sometimes they all go away like in June and then you have a whole group of new, new yeah. people coming in. We would literally, new people come in. I go, I'm Kelly. This is Anne. This is Eleanor. She also goes by Nora. We both have worked at Second City for over 30 years, and we have a Bernese Mountain Dog named Benchley, who's a jerk. Um, who are you? Hmm. And then they would tell us, or they would they'd be like, 
I love dogs. There was a lot, there was a lot of that yeah. and b- bonding over pictures of dogs. And this meant that we didn't just have caregivers. We had an army of caregivers. I am still in touch with many of the nurses who work with Nora. And cause we just built up this, like it started very low stakes. It was just some information, but then gradually that reveals more. And so they're, so they're not just seeing a girl with cancer, they're seeing Nora. And they, and they, and by the way, that became really important because when you see someone, you get their tells. So if something was really going off, they knew it and it would yeah. be like, okay, we need to go to the emergency room. Or, and I remember I have a doctor going, when I found out it was you two who called, I was like, get them in here. Cause they're not going to call unless it's real. Um, and so it was like, we created a kind of shorthand that was huge. Um, and again, it, it, it created relationship and deep to, deepen those those connections so that's like just a very tactical thing that that any of us can do if we feel like why is why am i not connecting share some stuff about you even if it's just like what sports you like yep that's great yeah i think the old school was uh keep yourself at home right that's that's kind of the old school way of work and uh yeah i ain't that way anymore especially with the generation coming up no, and even even if you don't like it, you get. <laughs> you like yeah, that, that's right? hey, it, sorry. It, sorry, there, there's yeah, there's going to be more of them than there are us, and it's changing. Yeah. Uh, well, time has flown by. I will find some other excuse to get you back on here because I have so much more I'd love to talk to you about. Sure. Um, or maybe I'll hunt you down next time in Chicago. But thank you so Excellent. much. We close with two questions. Uh, one one's kind of serious, and one's yeah. fun. I, I, I'm I'm supposed to improvise them as I go, so. Uh, the, the, the first one, you mentioned mentorship. This is kind of a serious question. A lot of people going through life, wishing they had a mentor, any advice for someone who is seeking out a mentor of, uh, things to do or, or how to approach that. So I talked about Bernie Solins, co-founder of second city. He's passed away a fairly long time now. Um, his advice for me, when I said I wanted to be in theater, he goes, if you want to be in theater, Go work in a theater, even if that's, you know, tearing tickets or washing dishes. Washing dishes. Yeah. If 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 I'm if I want to work at NPR, go to NPR and just <laughs> get whatever job you can get. So so proximity is a thing. Um, yeah. it's it's important. So you just if you can get near, we have so many interns that have gone through Second City who wanted to do this work. And I am more than happy to meet with all of them and do. Um, and there's others here who are like that, that as well, that that's not a burden. That's, that's, I think part of the gig. Um, and, and again, m- more people are like that than, than the opposite. You know, if someone's shutting you down, yeah, you don't keep knocking on that door, but I, I think many people don't even knock on the door. Yeah. So I think that that is give yourself permission, uh, to have someone potentially say no to you. And you're going to find that they're probably going to say yes to you more than they say no to you. I love that proximity and, and, and basically just ask, ask, ask yeah. to be close to them. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. Here's the, here's the fun question. You have to do one improv show to change the world. The, all of human existence depends on this show being good. Yeah. Living or dead. I'm going to have to have you cast. How many? Four, four improvisers four. to save the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tina Fey. Scott adds it. Kevin Dorf and Amy Poehler. And if you don't know Kevin or Scott, I think everyone probably knows Tina and Amy. Kevin and uh, uh, these are people who were in their casts who are considered. Scott Adsit was Pete on 30 Rock. He's been in a number of films. Kevin's been on writing staffs for Conan and and other places. Uh, They and there's more like I'd probably do more like six and add in a couple other people. Um, are people who just improvise so beautifully and effortlessly that people are convinced it was scripted and, and it's not like, like we have so many rules here to try, like, like if you work here, you're not allowed to give a suggestion because we don't want anyone to be like, well, I was a plant. I can tell you in 60 plus years in second city, there's never been a plant. That's, that's just doesn't, that's, yeah. there's too much pride for those people yeah, on stage. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. You just offended every other improviser in the world if they hear this. So that's I did. awesome. And yeah. but now maybe Amy and Tina will share the podcast. That was my hope. Yeah, so, yeah there you go. Yeah. We, we can only hope. Yeah. 
Kelly, this was awesome. And thank you so much. We'll talk again, I'm sure. Uh, you were an amazing guest. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. All right. Talk to you later.